the real way to do CRO, the way to find those consistent 10, 15, 20% increases is look at something as a test was more profitable. How can you double down on that on your next split test? Don't move to a new hypothesis. Double down on that intel that you learned. All right, folks, welcome back to your favorite D2C podcast. Today, we have the optimization expert recently off a phenomenal exit. He's actually, I think, going to go gallivant in Europe for a little bit with the lady to celebrate. Um, and then he has some uh, stealth startup stuff. Sorry to use stealth startup. It's a little douchey, but we'll actually spill the tea later in the in the show. But he's working on some really cool uh, project that uh, Ash and I had the opportunity to have a peek into. And it's it's pretty awesome stuff. But speaking of Ash, the best looking New Jerseyan, my favorite Indian, I got to uh, see Big Ron. Did, I didn't get to see you. You didn't come. Did you? It was just Ron, right? My, my worlds wrong. are melding together. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, because Lex, you hung out with Lex like the next weekend or something like that. Because, yeah. Yeah. But uh, how you been? Good. We're uh, coming up on two months out from Walmart launch and things are crazy. But uh, Oh, my gosh. Good. Amazing. Um, well, for those of you that don't know, aren't OG of the show, we actually did one of our first person, I think our first actually in-person um, ad spend in New York, uh, what, like six, eight months ago or something like that. So we're probably going to, we'll, we'll actually, let's do that first. Let's do a little quick primer um, on some CRO stuff, and then let's get into some spicy stuff. We're not going to go as deep into the CRO kind of basics, things of that nature, because we did that uh, on the first pod. So I'll link that in the show notes if you guys want to go in, get into that. Um, it's super incredible, incredibly tactical, but, um, Dylan, let's do kind of maybe like a three, five minute primer overview. Let's talk about, I guess the too long didn't read of what conversion rate optimization is. How's it work? Maybe some big mistakes in there. Um, what are the latest trends you're seeing? And then from that, we can dive into some more, uh, juicy kind of deeper topics to, to keep the show moving. Sweet. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Super stoked to be here again. That's pretty solid. Um, I think yeah, a, I think you might be our first uh, two-time guest. We we need to send you like a medal or a we had Shaq. Or Let's go. We had Shaq. Oh, we had Shaq twice. Two, baby. Yeah. Damn it! Damn Did I curse? It. See, of course, yeah, of course. Yeah, they, they bleep it out. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Shaq's that guy. first one didn't even count. He was roaming the streets of Barcelona. Oh, so. I forgot about that guy. Will not. Dude, small digression, and then we'll get to you, Dylan. That guy doesn't say no to anything. He was, I had to tell, we were going to do like some webinar or something for foreplay, and it was on his wedding, and he had accepted. <laughs> I was like, dude, you're getting married that day. He was like, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> anyway, Shaq, he, he's a lunatic. Okay, Dylan, basics of CRO, most common mistakes, uh, some trends, and then let's get into it. What a guy. Um, sweet. Well, yeah, for those who don't know, CRO is conversion rate optimization. It's the entire art of making your website convert better. Um, one of the biggest mistakes is that people don't realize CRO is not just about your website. Right. CRO is the entire funnel. Um, you have tons of different traffic sources typically. Um, so understanding each of those and really segmenting them into uh, different areas because someone coming from Google is inbound. They look typically for more information. Someone from Facebook is in more of the discovery mode. So they're looking for you know uh, more of an intro, right? So. Um, super interesting in that regard. Um, split testing is obviously the ultimate end goal to be able to like very carefully, um, test every part of your site. So that way you're not, um, just making giant changes. I said this a couple times on Twitter, but anyone does, anyone who does above like, I don't know, 250,000 a month. If you rebuild your whole website, you're an idiot yeah. because you'd never run ads without attribution, right? So why would you ever change your whole website without knowing what changes did what? So I think I mentioned that on the last podcast, but spreading the good word, don't rebuild your whole website. Dev agencies, sorry, uh, you know, focus on the smaller ones, but yeah, super important. So um, split testing is kind of the end goal. Um, you need a certain amount of traffic to do it, um, which I can go into in a little bit. So smaller brands have to let tests run for like super long because sure. they need enough data to actually make a conclusive you know, decision that this is enough data and enough, you know, of a lift to actually implement. So the one big thing that I've also been talking about lately is I can, you know, at splittesting.com, my agency, um, we work with eight and nine figure brands. They all have more than enough traffic. Anyone I'll be above anything like that. No worry on traffic, but to the smaller brands, 
there's so many facets of CRO that is not split testing. A lot of people think that split testing is synonymous with CRO. Your site speed, super crucial. There's some people out there that like dev agencies that just will rebuild your website, change nothing about the front end and just make it optimized way faster. Of course, you can like compress images, delete, you know, apps you're not using, all that basic stuff. You can Google around for like Lazy basics that don't require stuff. development. Yeah, exactly. So there's plenty that you can do that regard, but that's number one. Um, number two, building custom landing pages for where you push traffic to, mission critical. Um, I've also been saying lately you can just split test your headlines, which is really simple, um, something that you can do anytime. Customer research, right? There's four pillars. Like I actually have like shared a spreadsheet in a lot of ways. Um, the right way to like funnel hack, right? And like to take inspiration from a landing page that's doing really well for another brand. For you to build a landing page in-house, the main thing is looking at competitor analysis. So it's not like you take it, you just change the copy to like your brand and you run with it. That's not the right way to like funnel hack or like actually take inspiration and do CRO, even if it's not split testing. So the four like, you know, pillars that I always call of um, true like, you know, competitor analysis is take a landing page or even a full website, find like four or five brands that kind of fit something similar to you. Take a look at their angle that they sell, like the core fundamental reason of why they buy. Number two, look at the body copy, like the backup to their claim. Number three, look at the images because they are way more important than people give it credit to. And yep. then number four is the actual UX and usability of it, which is just, you know, where elements are, the flow of the page, like what their buy box looks like. So you need to analyze all four of those separately because you may notice certain things are working for certain brands and not for others. You might see that an angle is similar on all of them, maybe test that angle. You know, it's like you have to do all four of those pillars of like research, but also beyond CRO that helps on your ads. It helps on your email marketing. It helps with influencer marketing. Every single facet of marketing, I kind of say is CRO, like you have to optimize every area of marketing. It may not be like conversion rate optimization. Anything in you you improve about any part of your funnel is CRO. So broaden your horizon to not just think of optimizing your website, but your funnel as a whole. And your funnel starts way before your website. I love that. Um, I actually did this uh, in real time because uh, I, I've been trying to get on this AI train. So what you're talking about is sensational, but now you can kind of fast track it. So uh, I don't have, I'm still on the poor person plan. They, they haven't given me the internet usability on chat GPT. So I'm slumming it around here with Bard. Um, but let me know if this hits Ash, cause I put in what are the value props on my Okay. Here's what it gave me. The value props on my are transparent products. Avi products are made with high quality ingredients and are free of fillers, binders, and artificial sweeteners. Real results. Avi products are clinically proven to deliver real results. Taste. Avi products are delicious and easy to drink. Convenience. Avi products are available online and in select retailers. Shout out Vitamin Shop. Vitamin Shop. If you know, you know. Affordability. Avi products are priced competitively. In addition to these value props, Avi also offers a number of other benefits, including free shipping. Avi offers free shipping on orders over 65 beans. Rewards program. Avi members earn points for every purchase, which can be redeemed for discounts on future purchases and a money-back guarantee, Avi offers a 100% satisfaction guarantee on all products. If you're looking for a high-quality, effective, and delicious collagen supplement, Avi is a great option. With its transparent products, real results, taste, convenience, affordability, and other benefits, Avi is the obvious choice for health and beauty. That's pretty that good, amazing. right? That was literally in I, two seconds. And so I buy to, it. To, right? And to, uh, the marketing guy must be good over there. Uh, the... He, but to your point, Dylan, you could easily do like this would have taken me hours to do. And now you can literally pop in your top competitors, go to SEM Rush or whatever, look at who's your top competitors are, and then just do this and then synthesize all those value props into the things that actually align with your business. Um, anyways, sorry to derail your flow, but I thought that was just a really great point in terms of competitive research, because I think now is it, it's it's the easiest time ever that you can actually because what I had found in research was that a lot of times so much effort and resources is spent on the data aggregation that like it, say if you have like 10 hours to spend seven hours might be on data and three hours are on actually like synthesizing that data into how it helps your business. Whereas now 
you can truncate that, still spend 10 hours, but maybe you spend two hours on the research and now you have eight hours to actually pontificate on the, all this stuff. Anyways, back to you, but that was just, I, th- I thought that was a really fascinating point uh, yeah. in terms of how you think of competitive research. No, it's killer. The only but that I have there is th- I told you four. It's the angle. It's the body copy that like, you know, backs it up. It's the images and the UX. Everything there is only the body copy that supports the main angle. So yes, AI helps with that. It doesn't show the UX. It doesn't analyze the images. It doesn't analyze the core angle that they're going for. So yes, that supports. Fair play. That's Fair only play. one out of four categories. Fair play. Fair play. Maybe Yeah, I guess I have to figure out an image thing, but that's a really good play. I, uh, very good pushback. Um, okay, so CRO helps make more money. A rising tide lifts all boats. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes? And then we'll jump into, I really, uh, Jesse had a really interesting question that I think we can riff on, um, about kind of the, the, the tension, if you will, between brand and direct response, but, um, what, yeah, yeah, exactly. We got this foreshadowing is what the kids call it. Um, but is there any big mistakes or kind of red flags or things that people should stay away from if you're just starting out, get it? I, I know you said, don't rebuild the big website. Is there any other kind of two or three things that's like, Hey guys, you can start anywhere, but make sure you don't go down X, Y, or Z road. Totally. Um, just make massive changes, right? Like other than full websites, like I know Ash told me he redesigned his homepage, which I was like, ah, I don't know, dude, like, you know, be careful. Cause you know, first time visitors might be different than returning visitors. That's like a huge issue. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two that I would go for is not looking enough at like the whole funnel and where they are. It's called empathy mapping. What is going on in someone's head at every single step? You can literally write out when they're looking at an ad, what's their thought. Then when they look at the landing page, what is their thought? Then when they click to a PDP, if that's what goes next, what's their thought? Then when they're in the cart, what's their thought, right? So that empathy mapping is something that's huge. Speaking of your empathy mapping, and uh, and I, I promise Ash isn't paying me to gas him up, but one of the things that I think uh, he does really well was integrating post-purchase surveys to essentially reverse engineer what that empathy, empathy mapping looks like. What are the objections? Why did you buy today? Who are you buying for? Et cetera, et cetera. And using that to kind of, again, reverse engineer from the purchase all the way up to what's the first pathway these people want to take? What do they want to see? Is it a billboard? Is it a picture? Is it social proof? And then walking them down through that funnel. And I think uh, a post-purchase survey is one of the best ways to do that because it's not one of the worst things you can do is market to people that don't want to buy. And then you take their advice where it's like, oh, I would buy it if it was cheaper. I would buy if it it was neon green or something. You're like, okay, but you haven't given me any money. So why? And so I think that's why a post-purchase survey is way more impactful because you're actually getting feedback from the people that gave you the money. Yeah. So um, I sparked it. And this is actually a perfect answer to go right into our brand versus direct response topic. Um, one big problem that I see, to be honest, it's all parts of marketing. And again, CRO kind of looks at all parts of marketing is making emotional decisions. That's a big thing in business that just high level, try not to make emotional decisions. Like we're humans, we have hearts, so we definitely have emotions, but that kind of goes to the website redesign, which in brand people are like, man, we've had this for two years. We haven't updated it. We haven't changed it. We need a, a fresh new perspective. That is a very emotional decision. That is not a business logical decision. Um, A lot of people who are our clients at splittesting.com, you're paying us a crap ton of money to optimize your website. Why would you tell us that something doesn't feel good to you? If we show data, empirical evidence, and competitor analysis that shows why something should change to a certain different thing, I don't know. I don't like it. I I don't feel like that. And any marketer that ever says the word I is wrong because you're likely not in your demographic, right? I'd assume that middle-aged women is probably, you know, most of Obvi's like demographic, I'm assuming. Um, Ash is not a middle-aged woman unless, you know, uh, some transitions happening, but uh, maybe the (laughs) age is different. (laughs) Sorry, not fully PC. But actually, I also just remembered my answer from before, which was the one I forgot. Um, The biggest mistake that I see people make as well is looking at your conversion rate. Uh, Shout out Charlie who said ROAS. In a lot of ways, I've been waiting to say conversion rate. 
Ooh. a lot of people come to hear that, like they come to me, they're like, Hey man, I'm converting at 2.5%. Is that good? Your conversion rate is a sum total of literally every single thing that happens in your business. Do people come on a bunch of times and not buy? If your AOV is 2000 versus 20, your conversion rate is going to be way lower on 2000 versus 20 might be more profitable, but your conversion rates, a complete vanity metric. And people like, you know, sometimes the agency are like, we've been working with you guys for like, I don't know, six, seven months and our conversion rates the same. Well, you tripled your ad spend and you have the same ROAS. That means we're crushing it because the more top of funnel new people that discover you, your conversion rate's going to go down. So I could, if you're out of stock of your bestseller, if you're increasing your ad spend, if you have better customer support, people will come back less to go check. Conversion Improve rate your site will speed. go up. Yeah. Like literally everything in your business affects your conversion rate. And at the Whaley's, shout out Whaley's, which is my favorite event Let's ever. Go. I started the, the, the keynote with... Raise your hands if you look at your conversion rate every day. And like three quarters of the room, including Ash, raised their hand. And they were like, and you know, I was like, well, all of you are the problem. And let's <laughs> go into it. So conversion rate, it's only a vanity metric. The same way social media followers does not mean money. Conversion rate does not mean money. Conversion rate. Shout out, Charlie. Let's go. Ash over here catching strays. Amazing. Um, yeah. So can I get, can I get into it, Rama? Yes, yes. Let me let me put one more thing, and then let me let me toss it over to you because you you've been incredibly quiet this whole time because I'm over here just ranting. Um, the emotional thing I totally agree with. The only pushback I would say is, on the flip side, you want to connect with your customer as quickly and as strongly as you can in an emotional way. When people buy by logic, they never spend money. When people buy with emotion, they spend a ton of money and usually they're going to be more amped about the product because it's it's rooted in something that isn't necessarily utility-based. It's rooted in, I want my hair to look better. I want my husband to smile at me. I want my nails to look good when I go out with the girls. Like Those aren't logical utility decisions. A utility decision is, you know, I'm going to get better brakes on the car or something like that. Like that, that's not an emotional decision. But if you say, oh, you know what? Wouldn't you want to make sure that your kids are safe because these brake pads help your car stop faster? Now you're getting an emotional thing. I totally agree with you on the business side. You want to keep as much emotion out of it. But on the, the consumer side, I think the more emotion you can pour into, and this is kind of the same vein of kind of what Sarah does, Sarah Leveringer, shout out, um, who's incredible at kind of some consumer psychology stuff where, um, so anyways, I just wanted to touch on that because I didn't want to get, pe get it twisted where people think emotion is a bad thing. Emotion is an incredible thing. And it's probably the biggest thing you should lean into, um, on, on the consumer side, but on the business side, I agree. You should keep it emotionless. Yeah. Okay. My, my ranting's over. Jump in, Ash. Pr protect your honor. <laughs> okay. So here's, here's my biggest thing, right? As a brand, right? We have, there's the two approaches, right? Direct response and, and brand marketing. Me being, you know, on our paid ads all the time, I'm always optimizing our landing pages, our ads, this and that. Now, when it comes to Unkit's role, right, who's our chief brand officer, he at some point, four years later, wants to elevate the brand, right? I can't go back to him and be like, no, this has to always look like shit. we always have to run like we always have to run ugly ads. We have to run ugly landing pages. We have to do it this way. For him, I think when when like you said, I brought up, you know, we were split testing our homepage. We actually made three different versions, right? And those three different versions were one, it's basically giving a facelift to what was kind of working. So we're essentially just fixing the visuals and, and, and all those different things, right? The second one was a completely different layout, right? Different sections, different branding, et cetera, et cetera. So when, when you say like, we shouldn't be testing a new website, homepage, this and that. My question is, why can't we, if we are following the standard practices to measure the effectiveness of testing both, right? So I'll give you the example. We split tested version one, which was the control versus V2. We have 10,000 visitors a day. If I let that run for two, three weeks, I should be able to tell between new visitors, returning visitors, if there is an actual lift on both sides, and determine is one better than the other, right? Like, why is that incorrect in your mind? Because I think a lot of people think this way, right? So definitely want to clarify that, or clear that up and get a better understanding on it. Totally. <clears throat> a lot of people say they want to take big swings versus 
small changes. More pixels being changed on your website does not mean it's a bigger test, right? Like just changing a headline has been some of the biggest lifts that I've ever seen. So the problem with that, like that's better than most, Ash. Like you guys are running a controlled experiment for changing something. You can do a website like you can actually test a whole website versus a whole new website. It's called server side testing. If you ever want to go down a rabbit hole, you can do that, which is better than just changing the website. And if you're changing the whole page, that is better than, you know, not testing it whatsoever. That approach can be improved by, we call it bucket testing, right? So if you, if like, you know, each section that you see is a bucket on a website. So what if you go through and you give like, you know, you're able to do multivariate tests, which means you've like three options of the hero, three options of the second bucket, three options of the third bucket. You can go through and get more attribution because if you change your whole homepage at once, the hero way may be way more effective, but the follow-up bucket, the second one just below the fold, may be not giving lift or actually hurting. The third one's helping. So then you have to test backwards to see what actually helped or hurt to be able to move forward in like methodical testing. So what you're doing is better than most, but the better one is what we call evolutionary redesign. Shout out to like uh, Nick Harris and Brittany uh, Flanagan, like my, my heads of CRO at split testing. Um, evolutionary redesign is really the name of the game, which, you know, redoing your homepage is part of evolutionary redesign. But if you redo your hero image, your whole website feels different on your homepage. So then when you go and change the second bucket and then change the third bucket, change the fourth bucket, you know, do it over two months instead of being a little potentially impatient. Don't mean to uh, accuse you of being impatient, but yeah, like if you're a little bit more patient, like patience does. I feel a lot of people are impatient. Like it's, it's like, oh, I have this idea. I want to know if it's going to cause a lift or whatever. Like last night, literally at like 1130 PM, I was like, I got to test something on my buy box because it just came to mind. And literally 11.50, I put that test in, into the uh, Google Optimize, right? So, like, as a as a DR guy, like, I am super impatient. And I want to know, like, can I just, like, move the needle 15, 20% at a time with these, like, these changes, whether they're small or big, right? And and that's the other part of this, this controversial, like, topic of the big swings versus, like, the small stuff is, like, I've... I've I've heard you and I've, I've spoken to you about like changing headlines, changing images, changing like the way that the buy box is formatted. I've personally, again, personally, right? And this is probably anecdotal. And again, I'm not by any means a CR master that you are. I've always felt like certain landing pages, right? I feel like different structures and different ways to display content have always given us the bigger swings. And that's where I will go and really A-B test between the two, right? Like you said, minimum two weeks, always looking at the new visitors, always looking at the old vi- returning visitors. Like when we had that first conversation on the first pod, I never looked at those, right? I didn't even think to look at those. I didn't think that they would have different, you know, metrics or things like that. Where like if, for example, a test uh, returning customers, the conversion rate kind of increases, but like new customer or new visitors, the conversion rate decreases, right? So is that really a win, right? Can you Can you win on both fronts? So that's where I'm like, I need to make these like big changes because of education and, 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 and things like that, or even testing different landing pages. But I don't know. It, that's where it kind of like, I see your argument for both, but I don't know if not doing the big swings is like, I feel like people still should be doing that, right? Like testing different landing page, like a long form landing pages versus a listicle, right? I feel like that's a big change in itself. Landing pages are a different bucket of CRO than split testing your existing website, right? So redoing whole new landing pages. I mean, for me, I also own two e-commerce brands. I don't talk about them much, but you're reimagining your whole like funnel. If you like go from a listicle to an advertorial to a long form, I definitely recommend testing a lot of those to start, but as a brand owner, I'd rather find a winning landing page and then test 10 variations of that winning landing page versus testing 10 brand new landing pages. So that's a little bit more of mine, which is like, sweet, this is winning continuously for like a month or two at a time. 
let's optimize the crap out of this landing page instead of trying to reimagine our acquisition strategy because then you need to change your ads you need to change your messaging you need to change so many things if the landing page mm. changes right so i'd rather right. incrementally optimize that but yes landing pages you can totally test net new have a new ad set push it through as direct response marketer totally works um the one thing that i have a gripe on i agreed with everything you said there and i love that you go and impulsively test maybe uh run it by our other team first but <laughs> um yeah the main thing is um everything i agreed with with the exception of three words big swings and small changes it's four words S the uh, the word small and the words big swing <laughs> so um <laughs> just remove those from your vocabulary every split test is a split test so that's really like the main point of what I'm trying to get to is there's no such thing as big swings and small swings. There's no such thing because the biggest purpose of split tests beyond, like I call it the art of the follow-up test. You remember scientific method, there's, you know, six of them like to do from the only thing I learned from high school that I use now, um, the art of the follow-up test, which is the last part, which is taking your learnings. Like, do you sit there, Ash, and like other than the data say, yeah, this one, and then like go to the next hypothesis, the real way to do CRO, the way to find those consistent 10, 15, 20% increases is look at something that, you know, as a test was more profitable. How can you double down on that on your next split test? Don't move to a new hypothesis. Double down on that intel that you learned. The whole new homepage gives you zero intel. You're like, sweet, that was a good guess. Let's go. But then from there, you don't have any new intel necessarily, or at least you have very little. So that art of the right. follow-up test is where those 10, 15, 20%, you know, increases come from. It's not the big or small changes. So let's say you change a headline and it like crushes it, knocks it out of the park, 8% increase in like, you know, homepage revenue. Now, if you actually take that one and just change a hero image, which most people would call a small test. That one might be the one to blow it out of the water and give you like a 15% net increase. So that's why there's no such thing as big and small tests because the intel you take away from them is probably like a lot of people will have a hard, will probably hard disagree. I'd rather intel on my brand than a lift in revenue because then I can take that intel and leverage it everywhere. Email, ads, SEO, like media buying, obviously everywhere. So what you're saying is, sorry. Just to just to follow that last point, you're saying if I made a change on my headline on, on the main hero, right? Understanding that that change drove eight percent lift to me, and as a marketer, I should understand that changing that main entire section is what's actually driving the revenue. So, what else of that element can I improve? Is basically what you're saying, or elsewhere on your site, right? Like, let's say a different angle you test, like you know, like. uh hair versus you know i know you have a bunch of value propositions but let's just say grow your hair versus keep your hair like those are kind of the same angle but like slightly different so if the grow your hair angle works go change your product photos not on the same element go change your email headlines go change your ads like the ugc or whatever types of ads you're running go change those too so that follow-up test can really be anywhere in your business. You gain intel from a very specific test that is isolated, and then you leverage that for literally everything. Everywhere else. Okay, got it. Makes sense. No, it makes total sense. Yeah, I don't hate that as much now when you clarified because I think the one thing I would change in your statement is um, instead of revenue lift, uh, you're essentially... So what you're building is essentially a perpetual R&D department that you can then proliferate the intel across the whole site, whole ecosystem, et cetera. Um, but I wouldn't use the lift in sales because everybody's going to choose that. So I would I would put, you know, shy away from that where it's like, we're not trying to improve your conversion rate. We're in trying to build this R&D machine and infrastructure that can then proliferate intel across your whole marketing ecosystem that will then make your make everything better not only organic not only social not only so that to me is a a, a better tax forward than like if you say lift and sales that everybody else stops listening like that that's what i want but if you say hey you know we're not worried about conversion rate that that to your point is just essentially an aggregation of all 
it's almost like life, right? Like your life is essentially an aggregation of all the decisions and experiences that you had. Like how, how do you optimize for that? You, you can't, but what you can do is put in a bunch of intel where it's like, hey, these are the things I like, these are the things I don't like. And then you can build a life that you can constantly iterate on to live a better life. Whereas uh, split testing or, or just conversion rate optimization is essentially a function of intel gathering that then you can deploy across the ecosystem. Am I, am I kind of understanding that correctly now? You said that super articulately, super proud of yeah. you. That was, that was really good. And then the one thing I would add is revenue increases. Like it's not saying don't care about revenue increases, right? Like, of course that matters when you have a revenue increase and like a statistically significant and statistically powered test, something people forget about. Um, when you have that as a true winner, how, like, of course that gives you a revenue lift, go and implement it immediate revenue lift. But now instead of trying to get another 6% increase to go for a 20% increase, you need to do the follow-up test. So you explained it beautifully that it's an R and D machine on top of a revenue increasing machine, right? So having a revenue increasing machine, the tide that lifts all boats, that is CRO, that becomes 10 times more powerful when you think of it as R and D. If you just go pure data, which also might be a good, uh, you know, change into direct response versus brands. If you look straight data and then go to a brand new hypothesis, it's not really going to like give as much of a lift as thinking of CRO as also an R and D specialist. Then you can get an increase in revenue and then an even larger increase in revenue from the follow up tests. I love that. Okay, let's get back to the brand DR stuff. That's a fantastic that, that paradigm shifted me, Dylan. That's actually that was a really cool way to think of things. Okay. So kind of going back to Ash's example. So say Dylan has uh, happypills.com. I'm the brand officer. Ash is the CMO. Um, Ash is very heavily indexed on DR. I want to make sure there's an awesome brand. Um, we finally got in a little bit of money. I said, hey, Ash, you know, I can move away from Canva now. I want to hire a designer. I want to elevate the experience. I want to do all these things. And I guess the way I think about it is almost like the brand website is almost like the flagship hotel in the hotel chain. These are the main value props. This is the fanciest, this is the best. But I have landing pages that are peripherally connected because of the brand. However, these landing pages, one are, are satellite hotels, right? Like I might have one in Aspen for people that love to ski. I might have one in Bali for people that love to scuba because one of the things that uh, Ash articulated a few podcasts ago is having the continuity between the ad and the landing page is so important. Like you can't say, oh, keep your hair, grow your hair kind of stuff. And then you go to this landing page and it starts talking about making your nails stronger. Like that disjointedness, it, it really kills that that kind of flow. So uh, the too long didn't read is, what do you say to me when I come to you or, or I go to Ash and I say, hey, Ash, I want to elevate the brand. We're going to change this, this, this. The aesthetic's going to change. Vibe's going to change, et cetera, et cetera. And then Dylan, our CRO expert, says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. How, how do those, because they, they have to be able to coexist, right? Like I, I can't have a brand at, at, or a perfect example, again, is Avi, where they went through this really cool rebrand because they're going into retail now. And like a brand that is incredible and only D to C, like I talked to the guy at Strix, they do like men's makeup type of stuff, like men's care stuff. They had these incredible Apple unboxings like just superb, amazing experience. They can't do that in, in, in retail, on shelves. Like there's a whole nother requisite for shelves where you need to show the product. You need to have value props on there. You need to do this. And so how, how do you balance those two, Dylan? Like what, d does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. Um, another hot take, shut the <laughs> about direct response versus brand. They're literally the same. There's no difference. So first off, how do you grow a brand? By getting more customers, right? How do you get more customers? By going direct response and getting more customers. The more customers you have, the more word of mouth you have. The more word of mouth you have, the more people start knowing about you. The more people start know it just all builds on each other. So if you're just brand focused to start, good luck. Like blessings to you, bless your heart as the Midwesterners say. So getting new customers, growing the brand, like they're the same thing. The feeling 
of like what how people perceive your product. If they perceive your product better and you're speaking to them better, guess what? You didn't change your brand. You didn't change your direct response. You improved your website, which is CRO, or you improved your whole business, which is CRO. So the I would feeling push back they on get, that. well, let, let me go through it. So yeah, like yeah. the feeling you get, if you feel like it connects more with the customers, don't make an emotional decision for yourself as a marketer. Make sure it's emotionally resonant with them. If you make it more emotionally resonant with them, your conversion rate will go up, your revenue will go up, everything will go up. But so will your perception, which is, wow, there's this awesome product that like really resonates with me. Your copywriting can be brands. Your It doesn't need to look fancy. The fanciness might actually hurt your conversion rate. It, like That's a big problem I see that everyone does. So to me, there's no difference in brand or direct response because, yeah, maybe if you get to like Airbnb level, we can go to that kind of topic. But for everyone in the D to C world that no, none of us have above a nine figure brand, like it's, you know, except for maybe public companies, it is literally the same. It is optimizing for your customers to have the best experience and speak to them the most and make them buy the most often. Literally identical. Mm. I got some points. <laughs> I dare you. Bring it on. Bring it on. The wave of history is, a, is, a, is coming, the tsunami. Um, I, one, I totally agree with you that the DR and brand uh, kerfuffle is totally fabricated. Um, two, I think the reason it came about was because you could, back in the day, build a brand. Because I do agree with you that customer velocity is essentially getting products in people's hands is essentially the fastest way to get to a established brand. The And... DR used to be really easy, so you could actually do this. DR is not easy anymore. It's expensive. The The arbitrage is essentially evaporated. Facebook ads are properly priced now, not underpriced, targeting stuff, et cetera. But I guess what I'm trying to say is when I think of brand and direct response, brand is about creating a relationship with the customer without any reciprocity. Hey, this is value for you. This is that. I don't have any asks for you at all. I just want you to come to party, have a good time, if you want to look around, go for it. We sell some cool happy pills over here, but just jam to some Spotify. I want to introduce you to some people that are like minds, et cetera, et cetera. That's what I consider brand. Direct response is like, hey, I have X. I want you to do Y. It's transactional. You can wrap that transaction in emotion, which is a fantastic. But to me, those are two totally separate things. Like if I ask you to come to a party versus if I ask you to come to a dinner to pay for your seat, you still might come to both, but they're two totally separate decision-making frameworks. Or that That's my bifurcation. So I, 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 I kind of push back on a little bit of that. So, okay, maybe hot take. If you're telling me as a brand owner, you're trying to just give, give, give. Correct. What is your goal by giving? To make, when I ask, easier. To make you to make ask me, sales. to make you, yes, exactly. But it's two different functions. I'm not implicitly selling to you. Somebody that hangs out with you and is just chatting and like, hey, blah, blah, blah. blah and then, oh, and by the way, I have this cool heat mapping tool or whatever. But anyways, if you want to hear about it later, ping me. But let's just jam. I just want to create a relationship with you. That's a totally different experience than asking somebody to give you money. I would broaden, like back to what I said in the beginning, conversion rate optimization is your entire experience with the customer. Oh, I'm not talking about conversion rate optimization. I'm talking about the bifurcation between brand and DR. You said they're kind of the same thing. And I, I, I think they're in the same ecosystem where they shouldn't be fighting each other, but I think they're vastly different. They support each other. And I think back in the day, you could have DR to build a brand, like I was saying, because you could acquire customers so cheaply. But now you have to give people an emotional reason to want to represent your brand, to want to consume your brand, to want to with your brand. That has nothing to do with DR. Ash, what's your thoughts? You've been awfully quiet as well. You're so patient, dude. Okay. So I think direct response is what gets the customer in the door. I think brand is what keeps them at the house, right? Or in the party. I think when somebody, at least for supplements, right? If somebody's buying a supplement, let's say collagen, right? Which is almost like a commodity now, right? If I'm going, or even like magnesium or whatever it is, the ashwagandha that's been like trending. If I want magnesium and I'll go to Amazon and search for it, I'm looking for a magnesium with the most reviews and a, at a price point that I can afford. I don't know who the f I just bought from, right? Now with Obvi, what I want to do is I want to sell you something that you need, which is collagen for your hair, skin, and nails. 
But the experience after the fact is one, we have our community. We have the the, the dosage guide, the, the the recipe books. We have we go live every week. We do recipes. We do this and that, right? We have the YouTube channel, the app, everything. That I think is like the branding to make sure that hey, you didn't just buy another collagen, you bought Avi, right? And so like that to me, like the community elements, the, the added value elements, like that, and it's not really part of the direct response, right? My direct response is, hey, I'm gonna create a ugly ad with a an you know, offer and and an offer on my landing page and get them into the door and then sell them on, you know, Avi, right? And like there's so many people, like even vital proteins, right? People are like, oh, I use that blue bottle collagen. They don't know what the fuck vital proteins is. It's just vital proteins is everywhere. I use the blue one. What's the blue one? You know what I mean? So that's where I'm kind of like, it's separate, but I get your point where you are building up the brand by getting customers and this and that, but you still have to have these this higher power that's like keeping them in your, you know, your circle. So I'll, well, first off, yeah, agreed on both. Let me give a different perspective. You optimize, you should optimize your direct response efforts in conjunction and similarly to how you optimize your brand. So yes, they're two different things. I love the pushback that you got because it kind of is more articulate for me to speak about. But you're optimizing the whole experience, which includes the hopefully second third, fourth experience. The direct response approach is typically for the first, maybe the second, you know, once you get to third, fourth, fifth, and like retention for triple whale, right? Like that type of stuff, that brand is what carries it through. And from empathy mapping from the first ad or however they first discover you all the way to their like hopefully fifth purchase, that should be optimized together, all together. So although there might be efforts that lean more brand and efforts that lean more direct response, I want you to optimize the whole thing together. So that's kind of what I mean by saying they're the same because you're optimizing your whole funnel, including acquisition in the future. Your funnel does not does not mean your ad to your cart. It means the whole experience. So you're optimizing them as the same. Yes, there's different functions of what a brand does and what direct response marketing does but you need to optimize them all in the same way. So I'm getting closer. Um, the I don't like the optimization word because by definition, optimization is one thing. I think DR should be optimized on either CAC or like return on investment where brands should be optimized on these softer metrics like relationships, reach, impressions, these things. And so I agree that you should be operating kind of what you're talking about with the whole point of CRO, that there's this, you know, brain of, or, uh, you know, intelligence that is constantly being piped into and everybody is using that as their central source of truth to then derive the messaging from that. But again, I, I, I just don't think brand messaging and DR are the same things. Like going back to that party analogy, brand helps you know about the party. Ideally brand helps you get to the party. And then DR is what you get your money from. And then to Ash's point, brands, what keeps you at the party? And so there's really only one touch point where brand is not or, or out of all those touch points, DR is the only one that's asking you for money. And so I, I just think it's just a fundamentally different headspace to be into where I'm writing content on what the best collagens are. Or here's our collagen calculator or here, these things that are there's no monetary requisite on those things where it's like Ash can't just run ads unless those ads are like kind of brand awareness ads. But again, then that goes into that brand awareness category or that brand category where it doesn't have these, uh, this is, so this is my hot take. I don't think, yeah, yeah, but I, I just don't think, and maybe like I'm, uh, biased because B2B SaaS is so, uh, like the attribution is just so much like D2C or B2B SaaS is like D2C on hard mode. Like the attribution is like a pinball machine. Like like people might come in for a podcast, come to an award show, come, uh, you know, hit subscribe to the newsletter. They, and then they take a sales call and then they, they, they close. Like it's just what's more important, right? And so D to C is a little bit easier there. But I guess what I'm trying to say is I think CMO is a really, uh, especially at B2B SaaS, almost like a terrible role because you have to be DR in brand. 
where I think a better setup is having a chief brand officer and a chief revenue officer. And they are in tandem, the CMO. They are responsible for not only getting people to party, but also keeping the lights on at the party to keep the money coming in. Because again, there's just two fundamentally different headspaces of DR crushers that absolutely get the most money out of the most people. And then there's people that throw the best parties and they want to go to these parties and they want to know about these parties and this omnipresence that a brand can create. I think it is, and to be fair, it's contextual, right? Like, uh, it, I think like my other hot take is in verticals or if your product is heavily commoditized, that's when you need brand. Like Ash was talking about, like if I think of, if I'm all, if I'm somewhere on the periphery of collagen curious, and then I finally get over, but Avi's in the decision set. And not only are they in the decision set, they're my first decision. So I'm ready to consume. Boom, I consume. And a lot of part of that was brand. I just saw the DR ad and the DR ad closed me. And so I agree with your full funnel thinking. I just, I, I don't agree with they're optimizing for the same thing because they're not. Like brand and DR are optimizing for different things. Their goal is the same. The goal is to make more money. It's kind of that joke with the soccer player. Like you ask uh, go, like people what the goal of, or what the job of a, a goalie is in soccer or football. And they say, oh, keep keep balls out of the net. Don't let goals in. No, the, the, the goal is to, to win the game. The way they win the game is by keeping the ball out of the net. And so I, I think that would be just the only nuance there. I, I think I'm tracking your train of thought. It's just a little bit of semantic pushback. Yeah, it's the way I look at it is because brand, although difficult to attribute like exactly like it is on direct response. Or yeah, maybe lift, lifts or recall. There, there's, But the, candidly, there's all soft metrics. Like these are yeah, very difficult. Yeah, soft metrics. But you can also optimize for soft metrics, oh, right? Oh, 100%. Like, no, 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 100%. No, 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 no. I'm just saying the the soft metrics are very difficult to wrap a narrative that you can take to leadership to keep excited. Like that's the biggest challenge with brand is keeping leadership excited and invested because bad brand is like bad sex. Like no brand is better than a bad brand. Like like just just hustle your product and smash dr because uh, a bad brand is not not the path yeah i agree um the way i would say it is think of the whole thing when you're looking at the first purchase and the party because if the party does not match the product which doesn't match everything then you're kind of <laughs> Your brand is not going to be worth it. So that's kind of where I'm going, which is you have to optimize both together. Yes, there are different efforts overall. Like I can get behind that argument that there are different efforts like and different uh, purposes of the same thing, which is to make more money. I love the goalie analogy. Um, but you have to optimize for the party by getting the right people there, because if you have the wrong people for the party, then it's not good. Yes, I, I would. I would take that point. The um, the other thing I would say too is because you you hit hit on a, a trigger word expectations, hundred percent dr needs to make sure that the expectations are set. But to be fair, dr are like salespeople, right? You, you kind of like oh oh you need that feature, two weeks baby, it's coming. Don't worry. Um, when I think but why of brand, aren't you a salesman? Sorry to jump in though, but why aren't you a salesman as a brand guy? I'm absolutely a salesman, but what I'm selling has no monetary reciprocity. I am just selling, hey, you want to hang out? Do you think this is cool? We have this cool stuff. You know, whenever you're ready, come purchase. I'm not the guy. I need you in the car today. Like, uh, that's DR. Brand is about, again, relationship building. DR is about monetizing those relationships that you built. And if they get out of balance, then you can see some really weird things because then you get into a place of like, oh, man, I thought this brand cared about me. Now it's a transactional relationship. Once you get in a transactional relationship, there's no brand. The, the brand is dead and you better have either a monopoly or high, high utility of your product. For example, I hate AT&T, like the, the, the scourge of the earth. I give them hundreds of dollars a month for years and years and years because they get my cell phone. Do, do, is AT&T a good brand? No, it's a horrible brand. Comcast, horrible brand, amazing business. So I'm not saying you can't do this, but to your point, Dylan, there's a certain like uh, context needed, right? Where they're at, they're in a monopolistic scale where it's like, there, there's no competition there, but this goes back to that kind of axiom where in a commodified space, brand is the moat brand is the differentiator. So in collagen, instead of going and Googling, Oh, I want collagen. I go, Oh yeah. I remember that Ash guy kept talking about how amazing their collagen is. I'm going to look up Avi. 
oh, I looked up Avi. I get this really cool brand stuff. Oh, I'm not ready to buy it, but this is really cool. I'm primed for the purchase. And then, oh, by the way, here's an amazing ad and an offer. Oh, take your money. So I, I'm, I'm kind of in the weeds now, but I, I, I think we're getting closer. Ash, what up? One one thing I also, I, I think I mentioned this at the Whalers, which is I think, I, honestly, like I don't even think brand matters until you're like past like 50 million in revenue. And the reason being is you might start a company with a product that you think, you know, you have great product market fit, you're, you're trying to solve something. Like for us, we came out with our super collagen protein, right? Which was addressing the fact that the whole market was unflavored, boring, and nasty. What we found was is that a collagen that solves other problems as well, right? Not just hair, skin, and nail, but like also the weight loss angle, right? That became our top seller. And we ended up like pushing against- We're, we're starting a WhatsApp form or a GoFundMe. No, am I bad now? Shit. Okay. Anyways, hold on. So when we started pushing against like weight loss, that's when it's like, okay, that's a, that's an entirely different angle. That's getting away from what we created the brand for. And we have to get back to that, right? We can make that change at any point. All the people that we've acquired up until like 40, 50 million, if they came in on weight loss, fine. If they, if we've now transitioned back to like collagen, I don't think the brand is going to suffer as much as if you were a 50, hundred million dollar business. Because then it's like, okay, well, I came in thinking that this was a weight loss company, more of a beauty company. I can make those changes, right? So that's why I think where you said like direct response has to be congruent with what you're doing on brand. I almost think you can still make changes to brand as the direct response changes. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm tracking what you're saying, but I I guess maybe we're, we're lost in what I define brand as, as is the essentially aggregation or compilation of all the brand touch points, whether that be ads, newsletters, like everything is brand, like brand encompasses everything. Like your ads aren't like, unless you're running it from a a page or something like that, that isn't your proper business page. Every single thing reflects back on brand. Customer success is brand. All these things are brand. The brand is just, again, all those interactions that you've had and you just compile them together. And so I, I totally agree with you, Ash. And again, going back to that almost like hotel, I, I think of it like a franchise, right? Like the brand is a franchise and there's expectations set. That's literally what franchises were for. We have a brand and we don't want you to dilute the brand, but we don't want to run all these satellite stores. So Dylan, go open a Wendy's but or a Chick-fil-A or whatever. But these are the ways you have to run the business. And so that's almost where I see those satellite kind of hotels or whatever, where you, you can change the offers, but at the core, you're still going to be transparent products, real results, taste, convenience, affordability. It might be a different offer or an emotional hook, whether it be weight loss, hair growth, whatever. And I don't think product, I mean, product expansion can change the brand. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but I don't think these, um, you know, almost hub spoke where it's like you're still core of who you are. It's just the product is representative of that. And it's just a different product that could then expand your TAM into different markets. But um, I, I don't know. I, I just think that, it, the don't don't worry about brand stuff like i get the impetus of it but at the same time the way i define brand is literally your whole business so then it's just because you're under 50 million you shouldn't worry about customer success you shouldn't worry about email you shouldn't worry like that do, it just one, doesn't compute with me to the extreme right and if, if for example at 50 million nike was doing shoes right and then at 100 million they started doing athletic wear but at, if at like 150 200 million they started selling supplements it'd be like what's right but if they made that transition sub 50 million i don't think anybody would care that's that's my main I, personally i think nike could sell supplements and crush like they they fitness is kill, like one of the biggest one of my favorite collabs was the apple uh, nike collab they identified probably through uh, yeah, but it's, rate not, optimization. it's not consumables right it's not like it's not it's not a cons- again we're going to get into semantics here but like, i think the point is being that nike was athletic wear shoes fitness this and that turning into a consumable company like now i don't think would ever be the play yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna give a response to rabas and tie it directly back to cro and optimizing your website Look so at this. Raba, land in the you plane said, you said that you feel brand is everything in a business would you agree uh no well let me be a little bit more articulate or or more precise in my words Brand is the compilation of every touch point of your business. Agreed. 
so is CRO. Yeah, it's literally every yes. single part of it. The whole yes. thing. That's the whole I point. I get down it's with that. Testing on your website, right? That's kind of where I'm going with it, which is you're optimizing. Like they should call yeah, it for different funnel things. Optimization but I'm or with you. brand optimization, right? Whatever you want. I to could call get down it. with that. I could get down yeah. with that. Yeah, so I think we're saying the same thing, thing different on yeah. the site as well. Is where's the number one people learn about you? Your website. That's where people learn the most about you. Uh, yeah, they it, follow it, you on socials. They it can depends. Work mouth. I would say it depends. There's a lot of, uh, and, and to be fair, again, this is contextual, but um, there's a lot of like really killer creative live brands like Marcus at Minted smashes on TikTok. That's where pe- people don't, literally his website is a password protected drop. <laughs> that That's it. That's all it is. And he just sold out 200K of gear or something like that yesterday in 10 minutes. A- a- and his distribution channel is um, TikTok, essentially. He has a massive following on TikTok. And I see that as CRO. The same way that you're broadening up minds to brand, I also see CRO as not split testing your website. It's not just website speed. It's not just your landing page. It's like CRO is literally everything. So like website optimization or funnel optimization, I always say whoever named conversion rate optimization, conversion rate optimization should be pushed off a cliff because conversion rate is a vanity metric. So it's full optimization. So it's just business optimization if you really want to look at it. So it's like making sure the party matches the website and the recipes they get from Ash and this and this and this. It's the whole empathy mapping journey to make sure it matches. And that's where I feel like we can probably all agree, which is CRO, everyone thinks is just your website, but it's really optimizing the entire relationship you have which is also how a lot of people describe brand, which is optimizing the entire relationship you have. So effectively, yeah, you get a 7% increase here and you look at this thing here, but also look at the whole thing. Not And then also to even bring it back to what I said before, the intel that you learn from your split yes, tests, that, that might show you how to like actually, you know, talk about your event. It may show you how to like, you know, what kind of recipes they want because they like one product over the other. So now the intel you get from CRO helps you on your brand, which is literally all the business. And can I throw another wrinkle in there? I don't think it's a diode. I don't think it's a one way. I think you can learn from brand and have that um, penetrate uh, CRO and digital where everybody at the event was talking about X, Y, or Z. Oh my gosh, people are really stoked about this. Oh my gosh, nobody cares about X, Y, and Z. Um, so talking to your customers, whether that be in person, on phone calls and stuff, I think can matter. And I think that that interchange of information. Uh, so, so for me, I think where it landed is brand optimization, funnel optimization. I think those are two better um, thought processes or, or ways to think of it. And there's, you know, ways to measure those in both. But I, I agree with you. I think the they're the same. They're part, they're, the, they're part of the same ecosystem. So one might be algae, one might be this thing. Like, I don't think they're the same organisms, but they live in the same ecosystem. And if one falls, the other really either needs to be amazing to, to upkeep it. Like, again, you have, uh, if you have really big utilitarian products or vice versa, where, dude, I, 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 I spend like the way I feel rich is by like fancy sheets and towels. Cause I justify it to myself. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna use this every day. The worst thing you can do is buy designer towels. They are absolute sandpaper. It's horrible. I got these super fancy, spent an absurd amount of money on these Italian designer towels. Horrific. I bought these $20 Amazon Basic, but the brand is doing so much lifting in that transaction that I bought that. So I, I, I think it's, it, 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 to your point, it's the same ecosystem. They're just not the same thing. And to be fair, luxury is a whole nother weird, I that's my love language, like luxury anti-marketing where, um, I'm sure you go to luxury websites all the time, Dylan, and your brain breaks because they're the most, like almost purposely so like they, there's so much friction built in because you know, you're going to get, you're going to buy the product. You're going to figure out a way to get this product. But that's, what's best for that. CRO is not the countdown timers. What gets the most people on the website to buy CRO is to optimize the entire business, call it business optimization. So we can both get behind it, right? Like those websites that don't have the freaking countdown timers and the little UX buy box and like all that stuff. Powerful that does spinning wheel. For luxury. So yeah. And let, let me push or hundred percent. I just want to use different words where, um, 
the suboptimal buying experience online is a feature, not a bug for luxury. I agree. And same so same, same, same different ways. Um, Ash, do you want to round off anything? Because there's a couple other questions that I want to get to. No, thank you guys. This has been great. This has been great. I, this is what happened it. last time. This is what happened <laughs> yeah. last time. We're like, no, I don't think, no. And then we ended up like, we're going, all, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, but hey, no, man, I, I, I want to be the third person on the ad spend podcast. Shaq yes. does not get it on again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to make it happen. Um, okay. F- a first little fun one from uh, Jess Higher Fire Team. We love them over there. How do you pronounce CRO? We'll do uh, Dylan first and then you, Ash. You, Jess. <laughs> did, you, did you hear that enunciation, Jess? Oh, you have to, there's that intonation that you need to hit on. Oh, uh, Jess, no. Are, are you, are you, so you're not a I pro guy. I regret it. I absolutely regret till this day being on the uh, Ad Topsy podcast oh, because he's the, the man. whole time they called me the Crow Daddy. Yes. And anyone who says Crow, I literally can't stand yeah. it. So, powerful yes, Crow Daddy. Shout out to you. Powerful Stop. Crow Daddy. RIP, <laughs> RIP Ad Topsy. I love that thing. And then you bring yeah. it back. Um, okay, Ash, let's start with you here. What are one or two of the most impactful books you've read? Uh, what is your most interesting or impactful read this year? I guess it's the same question, but different. And then we'll go to you, Dylan, after Ash. Uh, the one book that I always say is, is Cash for Tizing. I think that's just one of the... Cash for Tizing. I think you have to order on Amazon right now. I think that's one of the biggest things as like just marketer, direct response, just understanding, you know, whether it's copywriting, it's it's pricing psychology. It's it's pretty much everything that you would need to really be a direct response marketer. Um, I find myself like I have notes in that book, or I have sticky notes of like the chapters that if I just need to go back to. Um, I honestly like if you haven't read that book, that should be like the first book you pick up like immediately. I feel a yeah. little bit uh, pants caught down here. I don't edit. I've never even heard of this book. Okay. No you never heard of bringing the heat. What a Bram mm. guy. What a brand. <laughs> what? Oh, first off too, I have no clue how I've transformed into this brand maxi, but like I, I, here I am. It's one of those Honestly, things I guess. Because you achieved you, it. Because you, you, uh, you saw the power of well, brand and what it's done for you and the companies you've led. That's why I think you've become a brand maxi. I, I tweeted yesterday like, I used to be straight up direct response and am, but like, oh my God, since I posted on Twitter, like I've now exited an eight figure agency because I started tweeting publicly. Dude, they're like two superstars on your team. Like, do you want those superstars to play well together or do you want them to hate each other and try and get a midseason trade because there's no chemistry? And I think the broader point, and, and I, want, I want to get your book pick, Dylan, but the broader point that I've taken away from all this is the more mechanisms you can build for learnings and information flowing throughout the ecosystem to then implement it. it th- that to me is the ideal scenario. And then it's not about brand DR. It's about, Hey, how are like, I loved your business optimization. I think that's a really good take. And then what are the functions of that business optimization? Okay. What's our brand look like? What's our DR look like? What's our customer experience? Like all these things roll into that business optimization. So I think that was very eloquently put. Okay. One or two most impactful books. What you got for me, D? I got two. Um, I don't know if you can see there, uh, my girlfriend and I have an entire library. Uh, fun fact, you need 500 books in a single location to register as a library. We're at like a Do little you get tax shy breaks of 300. Or uh, no, you just get like a sticker from like the National like Library Foundation. But my still girlfriend is guess. running for it. Yeah, she's got two thirds. I got a third, but that's still a lot. Um, it's mainly First for editions or crazy or just, just random fun books? No, I mean... We, we've got everything. <laughs> um, so two books that changed my life in the realm of business. Number one, so proud to say I exited an eight-figure agency uh, earlier this year. Um, there's a go. book called Built to Sell. Um, Built to Sell is about building a business to sell it. And it's a narrative nonfiction, meaning it's just a story, which is super easy to read. Like you don't need to learn a lot about these unique things. The whole point of the story is, I, I don't want to ruin it, um, but I might, cause there's so much more in reading it. There's a guy who had like a design agency and he designed like posters and stickers and websites and all this different stuff. And his mentor says, what are you best at? He's like logo design. He's like, cool, build your whole business on logo design alone. You're going to go broke this year and then do everything the following year. 
literally a couple days after I read that, my agency used to do Facebook ads, email, SEO, and CRO as a service. Dropped all three of those within three days. I let go of a 50K a month Geico contract for SEO, which hurt a lot. And but, Gecko got pockets. Dang, let's go. Yeah, dude, they do. They give they're they they're actually nice to work with too. Um, and then yeah, after that, I just went to CRO. I was broke for a year, and now I'm not broke, proud to say. So built to sell, it's not just for agency owners, it's for every type of business, right? So built to sell is number one. Number two, never split the difference by Chris oh, Voss. Yeah. He has a, a, a master class, I believe, right? Yes, he has a master class as well, but read the book. You must read the book. So yeah. he's an FBI hostage negotiator. Literally, the start of every chapter is an FBI hostage negotiation where someone either dies or is about to die, which is kind of fun. And then from there, it goes into how you can use that negotiating tactic in your everyday life. He comes from a slightly unhealthy perspective where everything in life is a negotiation down to like if you or your significant other is going to go like clean the dishes upstairs, like he sees that as a micro negotiation, which I don't love that perspective that gets like kind of toxic. But like, you know, if you do look at that from every point, uh, my biggest takeaway is if you start questions with the word why or is like, you know, why are you wearing that hat? You now feel defensive. You have to like defend the reason you're asking that hat. If I say, is that hat cool or not? You can say yes or no. Yes or no ends a conversation. The way that you can actually continue a conversation and get out of someone what you want is starting questions with the word what and how. If I say, how do you feel about that hat? You now get to like, you, you get to answer and I can ask you another question and another question. The person asking the questions in a negotiation wins. Uh, you know, what about that hat do you love? Again, goes the same way. Now to go back to CRO, when you're at doing customer feedback surveys, don't ask, why did you buy from Obvi? What made you buy from Obvi? Now they have to give an answer. You know, like, oh, why did you buy? They may say I'm like, you know, uh, they may not even answer the question because they're embarrassed about how their body looks. Now they're not even going to answer the survey. You just lost them. So, you know, what about Obvi made you buy? Uh, you know, not why did you choose to buy from Obvi? It's like, um, how did you come across Obvi? Like, how... Did uh, Obvi change your life? How did Obvi whatever, all that type of stuff. So that's just the one most impactful chapter for me, which helped all of my marketing, like in every single way, as well as my life and building deeper relationships. So never split the difference. Chris Voss, you're a legend. Man, those are powerful picks, guys. Um, yeah, I would agree. And there's a great, uh, I reference this a lot. This is my hippy dippy. Um, but there's a great book uh, called The Alchemist, uh, Paulo Coelho. If you haven't read it, sensational book. A little hippy dippy, but it's a. It's also I, actually I think it's a fictional narrative, but it, it's a really easy read, super fun. But anyways, the too long didn't read. There is there's a line in there where everybody has a question they're looking for an answer, and once you can understand what the person that you're talking to's question is, man, you can really really start to get into some really interesting conversations because you get you get away from to your point, Dylan. Those. Uh, th that's one of the worst things ever. Like, I don't think a podcast is ever, or I don't think podcast guests are usually ever bad. I think the, the brunt of the, or the weight of a podcast being good is on the host and shepherding the conversation. But sometimes you just get some people where it's like one word responses, even when you're asking great questions, that, that, that's, that's one of the most frustrating things ever, but that's, a, those are two great picks. Um, I'll throw my two in and then we'll do one more question. We'll wrap up, uh, power and prediction. Um, and actually this is a good segue because the next question is about AI. Uh, it, it's just basically this really interesting um, how AI is going to be essentially this transformative technology, how electricity was. And there's it's just going to change so many things. However, there's so many architectures in place right now, um, same as like back in the day they used this um, steam to power factories, right? But when you take the power and you try and dissipate it over distance, it gets or when you try and... Um, send it over long distances, it dissipates. And so what they would do is they built the factory around the power. And so that's why back in the day, all these factories were really tall because they had all the steam engines in the middle. And that, But now when you have electricity, you don't have to think like that anymore because you can actually, and then that's what uh, shepherded the uh, assembly line with Henry Ford because he could, oh, instead of having everything concentrated around the power. Anyways, really cool book, Power and Prediction, go check it out. And then uh, big, big fan of Rick Rubin. I think uh, Rick Rubin would oh, definitely be boy. a brand guy. Rick Rubin would definitely be a brand guy. Um, he's the most absurd, incredible, talented human, and he just wrote a book. I will warn you, the audio book is, the audio is sensational, obviously, 
Um, but it is almost meditative and it's very hard to, I, I would actually pick up the actual hardback because I found the audiobook was almost like a, a, a meditation where he just has this really entrancing voice and it was hard to actually keep the intellectual machinery on. Okay. One more question. I have it and, here. I have oh, the good. book. It's a beautiful great. book too. Yeah. It's a great book. Um, okay. One more question and then let's, uh, toss it over to you, Dylan, to wrap up and then Ash. Uh, what do I want to do? Let's see. Yeah, let's do, I know AI, 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 but I, I do think it is that big of a technology. So with the rapid advancement of digital technologies and AI, how do you foresee the landscape changing in say the next three to five years? Have you seen any innovative ways marketers have leveraged these advancements? Let's start with you, D, and then Ash, you'll finish up. Sweet. Uh, I'm going to give a shameless plug here as well. Um, mm, look at this segue. I've been cooking on Twitter, uh, about, um, my dream CRO software that I've been building for a hot minute. Um, I think AI is going to affect CRO a lot, but it's really difficult because there's so many factors. So, um, first off one thing, shout out Ash. Actually, I think you were the first one to say, like to bounce out your reviews and to send it in. I've done that on, you know, I recommend that to all my CROs and split testing and it's been a huge up level. So if you guys are not, if you're not following Ash on Twitter, he's dope. Um, yeah, take all your reviews, whether it's Amazon or your website, just bounce them out in a CSV, give them a good old chat GPT and just ask like, what are the biggest pain points? What should I focus on? How can we improve as a brand? Like literally ask every single question about that CSV. So huge, huge, like game changer. So Ash, shout out to you on that one, actually. Um, super huge. So that's one way in D to C that I found it to be really effective. Um, and the next one for AI is AI insights are pretty huge. Um, drum roll. Da, 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 da. While I um, I brought in Nick Harris, shout out Nick, uh, as the CEO of splittest.com about a year and a half ago, and we've skyrocketed since. Um, I've been out of operations for over a year because Nick is just a legend. He's a wonderful human. I set out, so heat maps are literally the most criminally underutilized tool in all of CRO. So what I did, I don't think anyone has ever said the words, I love my heat map. And what I set out, the reason is it's just clicks. You only see clicks and scrolls. What I spent the last year and more than half of my buyout money on, which is a lot of money, not proud to say how much I've spent, but it's been a lot. I created heatmap.com and heatmap.com is the first heat map in the world that has revenue attribution on every single element on your website with AI analytics as to what is working on your website and not. So my end goal is to make self-adjusting websites, kind of to make myself obsolete, take my brain into a software and straight up, you don't need CRO as much anymore. You kind of just rely mostly on the software with a couple tweaks, which is where AI is going, right? So that is my ultimate end goal. I know Google Optimize is gone, guys. We'll have split testing pretty soon. Don't you worry about it. It's gonna not. It's gonna be crazy affordable, like stupid affordable, not like VWO Optimize, AB Tasty. That's like five thousand a month, and they lock you for a year. It really sucks. Um, and yeah, the AI feature is pretty much there right away. So trying to build the killer CRO software. By the time you guys see this, it'll be on wait list. Uh, we're doing the smart strategy of not onboarding everyone in the world, having a wait list. But then after that, um, got a pretty big launch. And hopefully by the time this is ever uh, evergreen content right here, uh, go sign up at heatmap.com in the future. So it's going to blow your mind. And if it doesn't, I will refund you from my personal bank account, but not the business bank account. That's it. Love it. Now that's a good take. I think that is where it's uh, evolving to is ultimately... Uh, it was funny. AJ had this great line that I actually hated, but the more and more like is becoming more like more and more prescient where he uh, let machines do what they do best and let humans do the rest. And uh, I it, I hate it as a branding line, but like the, the ethos of it is so good. Um, and, and like a personal experience, I, I'm going on this crazy Euro uh, vision quest doing 30 days in Europe. And I did 80, 90 percent of it in chat GPT where I said, Hey, I want to give me, I have 30 days in Europe. What are the top cities I should visit based on culture, history, art, food, kind of all this I'm into. It gave me all these cities. I said, okay, cool. What's the fastest or the, what's the most efficient way to travel based off comfort and efficiency gives me the, the route, all this stuff. But what I found so interesting, my sister is a, a super well-traveled big wanderlust. Um, and she's now my VA. And I gave her basically this 80, 90% itinerary. 
And that last 10% was so important. So I think there's there's just going to be, I don't think humans are going to get pushed out. I think there's just going to be a shifting into the humans with the nuance because there was certain like restaurants. She was like, this restaurant you have to go to that chat GBT didn't say, or like, hey, this uh, this is a really cool hotel, but this hotel is even better, cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. So anyways, I totally agree with you. And I think that the it's not going to be doom and gloom. I think there's going to be, people are just going to have brain power freed up to do things that are actually more impactful that, is going to be harder to take on in terms of AI. Ash, what you got for me? I, I think you guys nailed it. Um, I think for what we're using AI for is literally taking big subsets of data and giving it to AI to give me something that's actionable. Um, so, you know, Dylan, appreciate the, the, the shout out there. Um, but yeah, literally taking every single like source of like, whether it's our comments on our Facebook community, on our ads, um, post-purchase surveys, um, Amazon reviews, uh, website reviews, everything literally like we had, now that ChatGPT4 has like the plugins, you can literally upload all this information. You got the plugin? Yeah. Oh. yeah. So the plugin, so it's, I forgot what it was called. Or it was like, ask your PDF. It's called the plugin, right? You can literally oh take a gosh. CSV, turn it into a PDF and upload that. Because right now, if you copy and paste right into ChatGPT, it's like, I can't, can't handle it. If you use the plugin, you can literally upload thousands of rows of reviews. And so that's where I'm training like my chat in, in understanding what my business is. So that instead of asking a very basic question like, oh, like I sell college and what are my, what are my angles? Here's what my customers are saying. Here's why they're buying. Here's what they ate. Here's what they love. Now you tell me in the tone of my consumer what should I be talking about? And that can summarize everything and just spit out very easy, like actionable things that I can carry out for the rest of the business. And that saved me so much time. So I think if, if people can use it as a tool to save time, analyze big data, um, I think you can, you can use it pretty effectively. Ice cold. Ashvin Melwani coming with it. Um, okay, Dylan, let's wrap it up, baby heatmap.com give us a, a, a quick little spiel there how can people follow you plug whatever you want my man this time's yours heck yeah um twitter at dylan ander finally not split testing.com anymore so uh yeah so um <laughs> yeah. go follow twitter at dylan ander um everything is going over to heatmap i'm dedicating my life to it every last dollar um there's a platform you need community and um, education, we're giving all three. People don't know how to do CRO. I'm literally giving every single trick. I'm not making a $5,000 course. I'm making it free for anyone who pays $47 a month. It's going to be mind-blowing. You should join just for that. Um, it's literally going to tell you how to optimize everything. It's, dude, I mean, two years ago, I, I would have said brand is bullshit, but now it's pretty valuable. So um, yeah, heatmap.com. Take a look. It's going to be everywhere. Uh, I want you guys to join the journey. I'm not fundraising from any VCs. Sorry, VCs, but VCs, I want us marketers to win. So like, let's grow this together to everyone who's seeing it. I guarantee it's going to help improve your website, conversion rate, literally all of your goals, even your <laughs> brand. So come join heatmap.com. It's going to be a full brand and a full change to the entire industry. I'm so excited, man. I'm so excited. Like there's like even even yesterday, right? And just to give you one example where I think Dylan, this will help a lot is when I was looking at my heat maps, and I know we're running uh, up on, against it, but like I see a lot of people clicking on our FAQs, right? Like a lot of people, even though those an those questions have somewhat been answered at the top. Am, am I hurting myself by having that extra that friction there for them to like read a little bit more, kind of second guess themselves? And so, like, I feel like this will tell me, is this section actually helping or not? Versus me going like, all right, let me A-B test removing it entirely, right? So I'm excited for that. I was looking at your heat map yesterday on heatmap.com, and I literally saw with the FAQ, it's now going to be as simple as how do you optimize an FAQ? It used to be for clicks. Now it's for revenue. Look at your revenue per session of all of your FAQs. Delete the Which ones, ones that are really, really yeah. bad and just move up the ones that are really good and just build on it. So it's like you don't need to optimize for clicks anymore because you don't know what clicks means by. That's why I built heatmap.com and I'll shut up. That's amazing. You should be charging way more, but 
that's neither here nor there. Everyone's yelling at me for it, but I want the people to have it. Like I want people having it. Yeah, yeah. genuinely. A man, a man of the people with a shirt like that, you have to be a man of the people. That thing is heat. I, I went love to it. Ghana to go meet my team, and they literally made me this by hand. They made this for me by hand. It was so cool. Yeah. Um. So I was driving the other day, uh, went on Craigslist and found some Avi peanut butter bars. And as I was going to go pick them up, <laughs> I look over and I see the bright lights of a vitamin shop, Ashwin Moani. What, what do I do when I see the bright lights of a vitamin shop? <laughs> you you take your car and you park it in the handicap spot. I don't care. You walk out. Right up front, you baby. Walk right up front. You walk into that vitamin shop. You slam the door open demand to see the manager and you ask where is this obby collagen and why is it hiding in the back and you get a couple bottles and you slam it at the cashier's desk and you pull out that that amex and you're like all right we're out um but yes uh follow me on twitter at ashra milani uh on mentor path uh two on this season two we just launched our first episode today um go check it out really it's a heater um Go check it out. Go oh, check it out. Oh, look at the tea. Can't even spill the tea. Look at the teas. This guy's a pro. This guy's a pro. Um, we, We've had a lot of really solid people on there, so go check it out. Um, Yeah. By the way, Ash, if you want to go head-to-head on testing on Obvi, I would love to come on Chew on this. Let's literally, I will build you a lander, go head-to-head, public split test, and debut it on the pod. And if you beat me... Yeah, if I beat you, yeah, free sponsorship or something. Oh, no. <laughs> Dinner on D, baby. I know what that exit st- stakes on you. Yeah, come to New York. We'll buy you dinner. What do we got? We got Whale Mail, amazing newsletter that we put out every Tuesday, Thursday. Go sign up at triplewhale.com slash whale mail. If you prefer to see our beautiful mugs and not just hear our wonderful voices, we put all of our podcasts on YouTube. So that's youtube.com slash triplewhale. Um, and then we have obviously um, ad spend. We'd love for you to subscribe. We have our sister show, uh, You're Not Your Roaz, where I talk to killers like Ash, Dylan, all the entrepreneurs, killers in the space. Uh, it's more story-based, so it's a, a little bit deeper, more human. I, I guess it's the brand podcast of the two, and this is more of the direct response if we're going to weave things in. Man, I'm on, hey. I'm on it, baby. Those double espressos hey. are working. Um, what else we got? Oh, we got the Chicago Road Show coming up. Um, so hit me up for invites if you're going to be in Chicago. That's in late June. And then we have the Blue Whale Group, which unfortunately is invite only. Um, but hit me up if you are one of our brands um, doing numbers and you didn't get the invite. We'll have you out there. I think we're actually going to coax Milwani into coming. Um, so ping me there. I'm not and in then... there. I'm a Triple Whale customer. Oh, you hit me up. Are you doing some numbers? We'll, we'll talk offline because there, there's a, unfortunately, there's a, 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 a My revenue. My number. Bajillion dollars. Four billion dollars. No, bajillion, not billion. Bajillion. Oh, yeah. Oh, so then you're in. Speaking of. If you guys want some amazing uh, tips, I found this guy on Instagram who does like uh, these guru takes. They're so good. The, the, the latest one was, uh, this is how I was able to retire my parents before I was born, which is, uh, anyways, if you, I'll, I'll drop a link in the show notes. And we got puppies. Amazing. What, what a better, what's the, Chief what's the puppy name? officer? His name's Chief, Wilson. CPO. You already have a CPO. Look at this, man. Wow. Let's get some money into that. Go check out heatmat.com. Go buy some Avi. Go hire Ash to ask. Are you on uh, Mentor Pass yet, Dylan? Or no? Yeah, I am. Uh, oh, yeah. I, Amazing. Secret. Yeah, sign yeah, okay. up. Amazing. Yeah. Ping Dylan on the, the Mentor Pass. Ash on the Mentor Pass. Get you some Avi. And then, yeah, and any reviews, feedback, anything like that is super, super appreciated, you guys. So um, we really love when you uh, ping us on the Twitters, LinkedIn, what have you. And then the last thing is safe word. We give away merch at the end of every show. Dylan, what's the safe word? Dookie. Dookie, how, how like D O O K I, like Green Day? Oh, I, I am big, or, I am a big Green Day fan, but D O O K E Y is what I was thinking. Do, what is that? Like taking a dookie? Yeah, it's. I thought it was uh, I E. I thought it was I E. Same. I, I can be wrong. Dookie with an mm-hmm. I E. Okay. Let's we'll, we'll split test it. We'll split anything, test it. Yeah. If you, if you send me, <laughs> if you send me dookie, E Y. Or IE, you'll both get merch, but you'll just get different merch. Uh, ping me on at Robert Ray Hill or uh, on the LinkedIn's. I, I check LinkedIn a little less, but I, I've been sleeping on that platform, dude. It does numbers. I just I just don't commit to it. I need to get better. Just there. repurpose Brand. everything. Gosh, you had to just get that last one in, didn't you, D? I love it. This guy. 
uh, folks, dude, amazing. Thank you so much, Dylan, for coming on. Ash, it's always amazing to jam with you. Uh, one of my favorite ones of the year. And as always, Dylan, you brought the heat. No pun intended. Heatmat.com, Avi, TripleWell.com. Go get you some things. Um, go touch some grass. And I appreciate all of you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.